I'm going to take this one step further, right? Again, as a sort of illustrative example, right? Uh, and uh, this is just, you know, I'm going to do it at a very high level. I'm not going to go too much into the details, right? Uh, part of the reason for that is this, you know, the architectures that result for matrix multiplication do get highly complicated after, uh, as you go through the analysis. But also, uh, I mean, the main reason I want to look at it is to show you one aspect, which is, related to the question that you just asked, which is the relationship between the projection vector and the processor space vector. Okay. Now, what we saw in the previous cases was that, right, I mean, you have a projection vector, which is some 1 comma 0 and a processor space vector, which is 0 comma 1, right. So both of them are sort of vectors, right. For matrix multiplication, what we'll see is that we are no longer in a two-dimensional space, right. First of all, what is matrix multiplication? I'm just looking at the uh, computation like this, right? I have two uh, matrices A and B, and I'm computing C, okay? So C11, C12, C21, C22, A11, A12, etc. Right. So now what happens over here, I basically take this C11 is going to be equal to A11 B11 plus A12 B21. Okay. Similarly, I'll have A11 B12 uh, plus A12 B22 is going to be equal to C12, this value out here. Okay. So essentially that's all that I've written over here, right? I've basically got all of these computations exactly the way that normal matrix multiplication is defined. I basically take some uh, ith row, jth column, take the sort of a pointwise product and add it up in order to get point i comma g. Okay. So that is the uh, definition of matrix multiplication. What I have drawn over here is for the case of a being 2 cross 2 into 2 cross 2, right? Therefore, the result will also be 2 cross 2. In general, this could be some m cross k, this could be k cross p, right? These values must be the same, of course, otherwise the matrix multiplication is invalid. The result will be some m cross p, okay? So it's possible to extend the ideas that I'm sort of showing over here into uh, larger matrices as well, right? But I'm going to sort of use just the 2 cross 2 in order to illustrate the ideas. What is the first thing that we want to do? We now have the equations. We want to basically see what the RDG, the regular dependence graph for this would look like. Okay. And the point over here is we now have, unlike the previous case where, you know, you had uh, uh, just the X, which was a function of one variable, right? Uh, N and the Ws, which were basically constants, right? Over here, you have A itself being two dimensional, B being two dimensional, right? The RDG basically ends up, and this is one way by which you can represent this, right? You essentially end up with A11, A12, A21, A22 corresponding to the matrix A. And over here you have B11, B12, B21, B22 over here corresponding to the uh, matrix B. Okay. And if you look at it, what is it that this RDG is saying? Right. At this point over here, I'm going to perform the computation A11, B11, and then send that data up. Okay. Over here, I will do plus A12, B21, and get this value C11. Okay. So this RDG, and you look at all of the points, right? C12, C21, C22, they all correspond to the way that this has been computed in the same way. Now, if you think about it, you'll also notice that, let's say I was actually doing a three cross three, right? What would happen? I would just have this thing going up here. What I would have at this point would basically be the A13 and the B31, right? And I would do a plus A13, B31, which of course would be that corresponding C11. Okay. So in other words, you can easily extend this diagram to larger matrices and the structure would remain exactly the same. Okay. 
So now that we have this RDG, the interesting thing, the first thing that you can notice, of course, is this is a three-dimensional RDG, right? Because the A was a two-dimensional uh, data set, B also was two-dimensional, and you know when you put these together and you get the dependencies, this is how it comes up. Okay. Now, once again, we can use, we are going to use the same kind of ideas, right? We have a projection vector. Right? The projection is again along some direction. So I need to choose some vector. Right? And what I'm going to say over here is the moment I choose a projection vector, it means that everything which is, I, I will still have this condition P transpose D must be equal to zero. But over here, D is a three dimensional vector. Okay. And what that means is, if you recall from linear algebra, the null space of that is going to be a two-dimensional space, right? Or in other words, it's going to be some kind of a plane over here. And how do you, in general, define a two-dimensional uh, plane over here? It's going to be a matrix, a three cross two matrix. Okay. So what effectively ends up happening over here is that P is going to be or rather p transpose is going to be some three dimensional uh, in our three cross two matrix multiplied by d this is going to be p transpose and this has to be equal to zero right and in fact it's going to be equal to zero zero right so in other words if i just picked one of those and said that you know this uh, if i picked one vector P and said that P transpose D is equal to zero. Yes, I can find a vector, but the point is I can find an infinite number of vectors, right? All of which are orthogonal to D and lie in one plane, right? Unlike the previous case where basically all the vectors are just sort of, you know, multiplying the same vector by a constant. Over here, the vectors that I can come up with themselves are all lying in some kind of a two-dimensional plane. That's why we need to define that whole two-dimensional plane as the null space. Yeah, I just want to consider the case D is equal to 1, 1, 1 in order to show what it looks like, right? So 1, 1, 1 would essentially be along this direction, right? You can see that it basically goes from the 1, 1, 1 point to the 2, 2, 2 point, right? Therefore, it's basically along that direction. So what are all the things which would get projected to the same time instant, right? Or uh, Actually, no, sorry, let, let me just clarify that. Uh, D can be anything. Let's let's leave D out of the picture. I just want to show what it sort of this kind of projection will mean in terms of the uh, scheduling times, for example, that we come up with, right? Uh, yeah, in fact, this example that we have over here, D is equal to 0, 0, 1 and S is equal to 1, 1, 1, right? So D is equal to 0, 0, 1 basically means Zero, zero, 1, right? D transpose equal to zero, zero, 1. It means that all of these, these two will end up on processor, let's say P1. This will end up on some processor, I'll call it P2. This will end up on some processor P3. This will end up on processor P4, right? And this is essentially the plane corresponding to projection, uh, sorry, processor space matrix, right? So this is as far as the projection is concerned. Now comes the question of time, right? And if I take time now into the picture, what I will see is that S is equal to 1, 1, 1. Essentially means that I'm projecting along this direction. S transpose into I is going to give me a given, the time instant at which something works, right? This will correspond to time 1, okay? or rather time zero. Let's just say that, you know, this corresponds to the point zero, zero, zero. Okay. What does this one correspond to? It corresponds to the point, uh, 
yeah i have i j and k right i j k therefore it corresponds to 0 1 0 right and t is again equal to 1 in this case this corresponds to 1 0 0 t is equal to 1 and this corresponds to 0 0 1 t is equal to 1 okay in other words what it means is that anything in this plane right these elements that we have over here get mapped to the same time instant t is equal to 1 okay and the next set of values right so this goes to t equal to 2 this one will go to t equal to 2 and this one here will also go to t equal to 2 right and finally what we'll have is uh, this one here will go to t equal to 3 for example okay so this is just i mean the reason i'm do doing this is to sort of for, to help you visualize what is happening in terms of you know uh, how the different elements are getting projected what this tells you is the d is going in one direction it is basically deciding which elements happen on which processors the s on the other hand is pointing in a different direction what it's telling you is that you need not necessarily have things that are mapped onto the success, you know, onto the same processor, all of them happening at successive instants of time, right? Because one possibility, of course, would have been I choose S is equal to D. There's no real problem with that. That is a valid mapping, right? In general, that is a valid mapping and it's definitely possible. The problem with that could be that in certain cases, it ends up with broadcast uh, edges where I need to basically take a particular signal across multiple steps at the same time. Okay. In this particular case, what happens is if I choose this, you know, D is equal to 0, 0, 1 and S is equal to 1, 1, 1. What I have from that is this is a processor space vector, right? Why am I calling it a processor space, uh, uh, processor space matrix? Because like I said, there are many different ones. All that we need to do is find that plane and find any two vectors that are orthogonal to each other lying in that plane. Okay. What does the mapping correspond to? This is actually for a 3 cross 3 multiplication. Right, what I have drawn over here. Right. Once again, I am not getting into the details of this. I am not going to work out the math over here. I just want to show this picture. Right. Uh, those of you who are interested, Parhi's slides, which are available online, actually cover this in full detail, right? They uh, sort of go into the details of uh, what is there and the analysis is also there in that book, okay? For the time being, the important thing is by starting out with a dependence graph that looks like this and by choosing these values for the projection vector and the scheduling vector, I can end up with something which basically does, you know, a matrix multiplication in this way, right? Effectively, what is going to happen over here is something like this, right? The A values sort of feed in from here, okay? And what you will have is something like the A11, B11 values will come in at this point. What happens? A11 into B11 gets computed out here. After that, B11 goes to this place, A11 goes to this place, right? In the next clock cycle, what do I need over here? I need B, let me see, 1, 2 coming in here and A, 2, 1 coming in here. Right? And at the same time, A, 2, 2, and B22 will come in on this one, okay? As a result, what will get computed over here is A21, B11, and over here it will be A11, B12, but over here, what I'll have is this A11, B11 plus A22, B22. Hmm. Sorry, that's not what I want. I want A12, B21, sorry. I want A12 over here and B21 over here. 
right? So effectively, in other words, the if I look at it, I will have A11, B11 coming in here on the first clock cycle. On the next clock cycle, I will have A12 and A21 over here. And in the next clock cycle, I'll have A22 and B22 coming in over here, right? During that time, I'll basically have also A31 coming in here and B23 uh, coming in over here and so on, right? So why is this? Essentially, what we are saying, in other words, is I have this pattern where this is going to perform one computation. In the next clock edge, this will basically perform the next two sets of computations while this one basically goes on and do it as a further part of the computation. In the next clock edge, this will do the first part while this will do something more and this will finish its work, right? Okay, so in other words, by you can see how this is basically mapping into a complete systolic array, right? On each clock cycle, a new set of inputs is being provided to the processors that is then sort of flowing through this entire design from top left to bottom right, okay? And as we do this, after a certain number of clock cycles, at each one of those points, one output is computed and comes out, okay? Another architecture that can be designed for this is basically using these numbers, right? 111 and 11 minus 1. How exactly did we come up with these? Don't ask me, right? Once again, it's there are, I mean, you can think up of reasons why you might come up with that, right? I mean, you look at the uh, dependence graph and then you would probably be able to say, okay, this might be a reasonable value. You could also choose something completely at random, but it would give you probably not a good architecture. In this case, this particular choice gives us another design which looks something like this. Over here, what happens is you can notice that the C values themselves also move, right? So in other words, part of the C is computed here. It then goes over here, then goes over here and finally comes out. Okay. So effectively, in other words, what is happening is that the C values themselves are sort of moving through the uh, architecture and are coming out on the edges of the design. Okay. How exactly does it happen? How are each of these things computed? What should be the values that are given at different time instants? All of that comes out just from this mapping, right? By If you look at this dependence graph and you look at S transpose I for each and every one of these nodes, it tells you the exact time instant when that particular node computation is happening. So if I see, for example, the node requires A12 and B21 for the computation to happen at time two, then I know that at that particular time instant, that is the value that needs to be fed in to that particular node in the graph. Okay. So this is the, uh, the reason I wanted to show both of these is just two things. One is, you know, how you can sort of take this entire design process and take it forward to larger uh, design cases and the second thing is this whole idea of you know rather than having a processor space vector you actually have a processor space matrix which defines an entire sort of null space and you can have multiple different designs corresponding to a single projection vector a quick summary of where we are right what are the use cases when is it that it makes sense to use systolic arrays right and Coming back to the basics, why did we actually come up with this whole idea of systolic arrays, right? Part of the reason was we had this thing where getting data from memory into the system was an expensive operation. I wanted to do as much as possible with the data that I have pulled out from the memory before I return it, okay? Something similar is what is happening in the case of matrix multiplication, right? I take one A11 value, one, one of the coefficients in the matrix, and it needs to actually be used for computing multiple different outputs. Okay. Let me make sure that all of those things happen within my systolic array before I dispose of that A11. Okay. So that is what I mean by multiple uses of each data item. Extensive concurrency, right? That is clear. Again, take the example of matrix multiplication. What we have over here is I could in principle have computed all of the C outputs in parallel. 
right? Because they have no dependency. C21 does not depend on C11, right? They might use some of the same data points, right? I might require the same data in order to compute two different CIJ values, but they don't depend on each other. At best, it is a read after read dependency. Which one gets read first in order to use for which computation? Okay. But what that means is I could potentially take one value and use it for computing multiple things at the same time, which is why it makes sense to have all those parallel hardware elements, the processing elements. Another thing that is important for this kind of design is that there should be simple cells. Why am I saying simple cells? Because I want to exploit the regularity of the VLSI layout. Right? I want to make sure that the layout is as simple as possible. Right? It can basically just take some computation. It takes some inputs from somewhere, does some computation and passes out the outputs. Okay? If each one of those processing elements was itself a fairly complicated processor, then whatever you gain by having these you know, small local links with delay elements on registers on them and so on, you are probably losing, I mean, or rather the benefit of that is not really going to be very large. Okay. The simple cell part of it is what allows you to design one small cell and just replicate it large number of times. Okay. And once again, the other thing that becomes very useful or important over here is that the data and control flows are very simple and regular. Okay. Think about matrix multiplication. What we have over here is, you know, a11, B11, the two data points come in, multiply them, add with whatever is present over there, pass them, pass, you know, the yeah, inputs that came, you send them in different directions. The output may be, depending on whether it needs to be propagated or not, once again, gets sent out. Okay. So, like I said, right, uh, this process has been analyzed for a very large number of uh, different applications. And uh, some of those applications include, for example, things like, uh, matrix uh, decomposition, right? So there is this thing called the LU factorization, lower upper factorization, which is used for matrix decomposition. There is something else called the QR decomposition. All of those have applications in signal processing. And there are efficient systolic array based architectures that are good at doing those. Okay. One other place where these have become sort of popular recently is in neural networks. And part of the reason is simply this convolution. What is convolution? In general, convolution is basically how you apply a filter to a stream of data, right? It's, you know, essentially this operation, sigma hk x of n minus k, right? k equal to some 0 to capital N minus 1. This is 1D convolution, right? I could also have a two-dimensional convolution, right? hij x1, uh, rather, x something okay a two-dimensional data point over here right two-dimensional convolutions are extensively used in most image processing related neural networks right they are used in almost any kind of uh, image processing but neural networks in particular have got to the point where the convolution two-dimensional convolution is one of the most basic operations and extensively used right and one of the sort of recent chips that has been designed for this, right, relatively recent, it's probably like three years old, three, four years old at this point, right, is the TPU, the Tensor Processing Unit from Google, right. So what is a tensor? A tensor is essentially a multidimensional matrix. It's not two dimensional. It could be like three or four dimensional matrix, right. And it's just that you know those are uh, tensors are effective ways of representing the inputs and outputs of the different layers in neural networks okay as a result what happens inside a tensor processing unit is basically huge amounts of matrix multiplications even though they call it convolution at the end of the day you know it's pretty much just matrix multiplications that are being performed and because of that the tpu has this system over here, you know, where it has a lot of things. It basically has this interface with the host, right? Uh, but typically the uh, TPUs themselves are meant directly for, you know, processing images. 
and they have huge amounts of memory of their own right but if you look carefully at this i'm not sure if it's visible clearly on the slide there are basically 64k multipliers right which is basically equal to 65536 right so 64k is 2 power 60 that many multipliers present in hardware on a single chip okay meaning that it can actually do 64k multiplications per clock cycle okay so just imagine what we are talking about over here right even with just 100 megahertz operating speed i mean this actually operates at higher speeds than that but even at 100 megahertz operating speed it would be like 64000 into 100 megahertz which is basically six you know if we are talking about teraops right so why do they need something of this sort go all the way back to one of the things that we you know looked at right at the beginning of the course which is the alexnet um, image processing network right that had something like 2 billion operations per image to be recognized yeah what is google doing they have google photos where they need to basically scan through and recognize faces first of all detect faces and then recognize faces for the literally thousands or millions of photos being uploaded every day by people okay all of those are getting processed right how do they do that they essentially need custom hardware in order to handle this and this is pretty much how they do it right so what is happening over here i mean you have this huge array of 64 and 65000 multipliers which are put together in a systolic array unit and basically are capable of doing matrix multiplications right not directly matrix multiplications it is also in it is effectively doing a form of the two dimensional convolution right so it's not trying to multiply matrices of size 64000 or anything of that sort it is taking an image which is typically of size something like you know 100 cross 100 or 200 cross 200 and then multiplying with these matrices right the kernel matrices across each and every one of those images multiple times okay so unlike what we analyzed just now it is not one single matrix multiplication that is being implemented in this huge array it is many different matrix multiplications right point by point multiplications that are getting implemented over here and in fact the way that the tpu works is because they need to work with many different kinds of uh, kernels right the kernel matrix multiplication it is actually a programmable unit right which means that you can actually give it the matrix values the weights to multiply with but it also has extensive blocks over here that allow it to change the control of the system right all of these basically allow you to change the weights it allows you to decide what is the size of the weights to be multiplied and effectively it becomes a programmable unit that can do all of this for right the matrix multiplier itself is you know something like this once again you can see what is happening over here just like we discussed earlier there is you know weights going in one direction outputs being computed over here right and as and when they are done a signal gets generated saying okay completed right so once again there is this whole flow which corresponds to basically what it looks like inside a systolic array right now there are I mean, you know both of these uh, uh, there is yet another uh, article on uh, this uh, thing called iris right which was a uh, uh, architecture proposed from mit right in 2016 in the iska the international symposium on computer architecture once again a uh, very good and general purpose architecture for doing these kind of convolutions targeted at neural networks right for image processing okay uh, one of the things over here in fact is you know the terms that i used earlier right weight stationary output stationary and so on are extensively used in this paper in order to uh, sort of describe the different kinds of implementations that they have for this right so this whole idea that you can think of these computations as either having single places where the outputs are being accumulated or that part of the computation is done and passed along to someone else is a sort of you know a nice way of looking at this entire computation and this paper is a good example of that okay one thing that you will 
notice when you go through either the TPU paper or the uh, IRIS paper is that you know you won't see a dependence graph or a mapping explicitly, right? These are still systolic arrays because of the way they function. But on the other hand, what they are doing over here is they are taking a very specific problem, limited amounts of matrix multiplication, and the systolic nature and the high throughput comes about because of the way the data is pumped through the system. Right? So from the point of view of the analysis or the mapping and so on, they are relatively simple. Right? It's not like there are some very complicated projection vectors and so on that are being uh, used over here. It's more intuitive. You can pretty much just look at it and see why a particular architecture is being used. But the point is because of you know this fact that they have these small simple processing elements with local communication they are able to get huge throughputs in terms of the total amount of computation being done. 